Hello, happy new year, and welcome to January 2023's astrological overview. I am Crystal Lynn Vitovich. I'm a professional astrologer. I'm also a co-host of the Alchemist Inkwell podcast. If you found your way here from that podcast, this is where you will find even more detail on the transits happening week by week throughout January. We cover as much as we can on the podcast, but we cover a lot of other things too. So if you're looking for extra detail, this is the place to find it. And you'll also be able to actually download the PowerPoint presentation that I will be sharing throughout this video by using the link that will be in the description for this video. So you'll have all the details that you need and the way to reference it throughout the video for where you want to find more information on which transit you're interested in. So with that, we're going to dive into the month. January is really doing a pretty interesting job of setting the tone for 2023, as you've probably heard me talk about if you've, again, followed on the Alchemist Inkwell podcast, or even with my TikTok and Instagram at The Real Crystalline, where we're doing skits and talking about astrology and other magical things. We're talking a lot about big changes that are happening in 2023. When I look ahead, the main years that I'm really thinking about over the rest of this decade are 2023, which has a lot going on, and then really 2026. So this is a big hallmark year for the progression of everything that's evolving in our world right now. And while a lot of that is going to be happening spread out, uh, there are concentrations in March of 2023. And then there are some really interesting, like I said, little uh, tone setters here in January, especially happening in the very first week of January. So one of the things that's going to be really fun to watch through January is that we have three planets moving from retrograde to direct. That will be Mars, Mercury, and Uranus, all stationing direct in January and setting a period of time where every planet that we that we track in the sky, so that is Mercury all the way through to Pluto, will be direct in the sky from the 22nd of January through the 21st of April. So that begins at the end of this month, and we'll talk more about that as we go as well. We also have the lunations, the full moon and the new moon happening in Cancer and Aquarius, as well as bringing in Aquarius season when the sun moves into Aquarius, which is the sign of the sun's detriment, but not necessarily a bad thing if you are an Aquarius sun. We'll cover that a little bit more as we go as well. And of course, for every lunation, for the new moon, for the full moon, and for the changing of the signs, I will show you a chart so you can get a feel for what the sky is looking like at that point in time. And again, disclaimer, you will see me look off to the side a little bit. I have screens up with astrology programs galore that I am looking at for extra reference to go along and add context to the presentation that I'm going to share with you right now. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see the lovely presentation that again, you'll have the opportunity to download through the link down below this video. So we're looking at January, 2023, kicking off the year with some great astrology. As I mentioned before, we've got the full moon in cancer. That's going to happen on the 6th of January at around 6 7 PM Eastern time. You'll want to adjust for your time zone for that. And Aquarius season will commence on the 20th of January. So that is when the sun will move into Aquarius and we will be in the season of all the Aquarian solar returns. Then we will have the new moon in Aquarius just one day after. So those charts will be shown together in this presentation, and that's happening at 3.53 p.m. Eastern time. So jumping right in to the first week of January, I call this the new year, new view, because we do have what is likely the, the busiest transit week with the most consecutive transits happening. As you can see, we have one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. So almost every day this week has something going on. And the reason that we have zero, one, zero, two is because my program kept trying to make these fractions. So I made sure that they would show up as dates. So what we're looking at through the first week of January is new year, new view. And I'm really saying this because we start January 1st with Venus conjunct Pluto. Venus conjunct Pluto, in any case, in Capricorn, would be like a extreme makeover renovation, maybe to your style, to relationships, to other things that are going on related to your values and art and beauty, thinking about the death and rebirth. So this is a very Persephone kind of energy, if that's something that you relate to well. 
So we're thinking about that energy, but this is an important thing that you might be noticing things from around December of 2021 coming back up in your life. And it's because in December of 2021, Venus actually stationed retrograde, which she does every one and a half years or so. Uh, she stationed retrograde conjunct Pluto, also in Capricorn. So we're returning to this area that we spent a lot of time in from November through uh, through a period that led into March and February last year. Uh, March, hmm, January, 2021. Nope, not January. We're also in a Mercury retrograde. So bear with me. I'm actually wearing my, you know, sorry for what I said during Mercury retrograde sweater. So it was November of 2021 through around February to March of um, 2023 that Venus began her retrograde for a very long period, conjunct Pluto, meeting Pluto three times, and then running with Mars into uh, Aquarius and beyond. So things that happened in that time frame, specifically maybe November 2021 into January, maybe early February of 2022, might be coming up for you again. Relationships getting that last uh, kind of final call on a relationship that may be dissolved or a doubling down on a relationship that endured. And I love the word endured for Capricorn. So that's just New Year's Day. What we're looking at after that is Mercury retrograde. Um, that's what the RX means, by the way. That's a retrograde planet. So when you see that in here, you'll know that that planet is retrograde. And we will, by the end of this, have none of that. So Mercury is still retrograde, having begun their retrograde on the 29th of December. Now they retrograde back in Capricorn to form a sextile aspect with Neptune on the same day that Venus will now move into Aquarius. So this is where we're thinking ahead in our relationships and how they support us and how they support us now, but how they're going to build for ourselves for the future. Like what relationships really illuminate who you want to be and support who you want to be and what relationships have maybe run their course. So that continues from the previous day. This is also a really great time to be thinking about meditation on your ideal future. We have this Neptunian ability to think outside the box, to blur the lines a little bit. And Mercury retrograde is asking us to turn inward and to really think about our own personal values with Venus moving into Aquarius, thinking forward in our relationships, our values, our ideals, the resources we want to surround ourselves with, what comforts we want to be able to have. So this is an amazing uh, day to be meditating on resolutions that you're thinking about implementing for this year, five years, 10 years, however you want to go about doing that. And then on the fourth, Venus will have her turn to form a sextile with Jupiter in Aries. So these are both benefits forming a pretty good aspect with each other. It's not as beautiful and beneficial as the trine, but it is this really great opportunity that we will have the energy provided if we want it to really do those big brain activities. Venus in Aquarius is thinking a lot and really going through the, how do I feel about that? What do I want? How do I get this done? Uh, what's the, the process that really leads to that? And Jupiter's like, okay, but I've got the gumption. So we have this creative solution ability for this day to really um, handle any major tasks that require a lot of brain power, but also even some physical energy as well. You'll be able to calculate your actions a little bit more. Maybe you'll be thinking quickly and you'll just be able to lean into that intuitive movement. This is also a time we might notice that we're inclined towards more humanitarian efforts, things that really appeal to us as sort of causes that we want to invest our time, energy, or resources in with Venus again in Aquarius and Jupiter are being ambitious, wanting to create solutions. Then on the fifth down here, the sun will trine Uranus, who is currently retrograde as well. But when the sun trines an outer planet, so that would be any planet from Mars to Pluto, we know that that planet is stationing to either go retrograde or direct. Uranus has been retrograde for quite a while. So Uranus is preparing to, st is stationing now, slowing down and, and visibly stopping from our perspective in the sky to then move direct again which will happen on January 22nd. So we're looking at the sun offering this trine to Uranus, kind of saying, you've gone backwards long enough. I'm here to guide you forwards again. And I love that a lot. Um, so this is liberation from what has felt held back. We had uh, this cycle with the sun and Uranus that began with the conjunction on May 5th. Uh, 
So around that time, because Uranus is such a social and collective planet, Uranus moves very slowly. So the effects of a Uranus transit will be experienced at a slow pace. So the best way to track them is more to track like headlines and track larger scale situations that have been going on. So when we look at the conjunction with the sun back on May 5th, things that were occurring at that time were these um, Uranus tends to be surprising and a little bit radical as well. So we were looking at um, things beginning to get interesting with Twitter situations. Um, there, there are headlines about the cheap and easy coming to an end as inflation became a topic of discussion. There were thoughts that maybe there was going to be a victory for Russia happening over in Europe. And of course, the court leaks regarding Roe versus Wade were a topic of discussion at this time as well. And if you search uh, news headlines for May 5th, you'll see all of these things that were out on the top of our list at that time. And those are the things that the collective was really thinking about. And that's how I tend to track these. So we also had the square on August 11th. So we were continuing that story. And this is a time when a lot of elections were coming around where we started experiencing some of the headlines around energy shortages. Um, at this time, Tesla shares were sold to finance the Twitter purchase. So you can see that storyline kind of continuing as well. And then um, this one I loved, modern and ancient crickets may have sung the same song. So this again is just something that didn't see that coming, but with Uranus and Taurus, it's really interesting that we're thinking about ancient versus modern in nature. So I just like that one, especially as a lighthearted option to be able to share with you. The opposition was on November 9th. So between August 11th and November 9th, we did have the station of retrograde for Uranus, where we started recovering some of these uh, topics. So we had midterm elections. There was a lunar eclipse around the same time and climate aid started becoming a thing. Climate aid and climate topics seem to be a very big theme for Uranus in Taurus. And Uranus will continue to be in Taurus through 2026. So we'll continue to see more of that story developing. And this is also, of course, um, when things around Twitter took on a new tone as well. So that kind of wraps us um, to the, let's see, does it? No. Um, so that's the fifth. There we go. And then we have the full moon in Cancer. The reason I said that wraps up the first week is because I have a chart for you on the next page. So that brings us to the full moon in Cancer on the sixth, which will happen around 6.07 PM. This is a great full moon with the moon in her domicile. She's at home. She's got some interesting aspects going along with her, which I'll show you on the next page. But at this time, it's a really good time to be thinking about nurturing your own internal evolution and being at peace with where you are now and whatever is coming next. Trying to have a little less of um, a fixation on control over it and releasing that whatever it's going to be, it's going to be great. It's going to be something you can hold. It's going to be something that grows you into whoever you're becoming. So just having that sort of faith and trust in the progression of your life with um, maybe whatever divinity you love to connect with as well. So that is on the sixth. I'll show you that chart on the next page. But just after that, and still in the first week, we will have Mercury retrograde conjunct the sun. This is the interior conjunction of Mercury retrograde. It also marks the halfway point of Mercury's retrograde. So you can see we have Uranus preparing to station direct at the same time that Mercury reaches that midpoint of the story of Mercury's retrograde. So this is a time when we're thinking about what have we seen showing up in our life since January 12th, we would have gotten hints, but January 20 or not January, December 12th, we would have gotten hints and December 29th is when the retrograde officially began. So what has happened in the area of your chart that has Capricorn in it? And you will be able to say, this is what's going on in my life. These are the sort of edits that I'm making. And then you can take those forward and start making those edits through the rest of the retrograde and then really applying them as the retrograde completes on January 12th. So we are very close at January 18th. The 12th is Mars direct. So on January 18th, you will be able to begin really letting those sink in. And it's going to happen naturally. I like to mention this every time. You don't have to try. It will happen naturally. But if you're conscious with it, you can have it happen maybe more gracefully than before.
So on the eighth, to wrap up the first week, Mercury and Uranus, those two at their very pivotal points in their retrogrades will trine each other. So this is the idea of we're turning inward still, we're thinking about what comes next. We're preparing to rise to that occasion, but right now we're considering which legacies get to come with us and what we want our next idea of legacy to look like. So that is your new year, new view um, presentation slide. Now we can look at the 2023 Cancer full moon. Again, I really like this because it's a full moon with the moon in her domicile. So the affirmation that I've come up for this is I am enough for then, now, and always. And the reason I'm looking at this is because the moon is full in her domicile opposite the sun in Capricorn. But also we have this opposition with the sun in Capricorn, with Mercury, with Pluto. So we're really reflecting on these things that we've already kind of gotten hints about earlier in the week with the Mercury retrograde conjunct the sun with all of these things happening. And we remember Uranus was involved and that's forming a sextile with the moon as well right here. So we even have um, sort of a witnessing in Hellenistic astrology. It's not by degree, but just the day before the moon will have squared Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter's pretty strong right now. So we might be really feeling Jupiter's influence in whatever area of your chart has Aries with it. So we're looking at this full moon and the house, uh, this 12th house doesn't really matter so much because it is dependent on location. So it's in the 12th house, it's rising um, for people in New York. But for people elsewhere, it could be an entirely different part of the sky. So we don't think too much about the 12th house or any house signification. So we're nurturing our own internal evolution here, being at peace with where we are now, with what's coming next, blessing the past us and really incubating the future us. And so we have this, again, um, these interactions going on that are saying we're changing but it's okay. We're thinking about new things. We're moving on from old things, but it's okay. We're really pulling that all lang syne mentality going into this new year of should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Maybe some, and maybe not others. And really for the sake of what's moving forward, what comes with us and what do we need to maybe resolve or put a, a close to in order to make space for the new things that are coming. I like to relate this to um, in the spring when you get rid of some old clothes and you, you make space in your closet for new ones. It's simply the same kind of energy in that case. So things to do to really honor this full moon. It's a unique one because it is in domicile. We have uh, intentional self-nurturing. This is a great time for salt water baths with candles and oils to exfoliate and release anything that's no longer nurturing you, no longer sustaining you, no longer really serving. Allow that to go away and to meditate on things that are important to you. I would recommend meditating and just seeing what comes up for you. This is also a nice time for a card pool to see what maybe you're not thinking about, but is important for your energy. So that is our first week of the new year. So as you can see, we're off to a really great start. I'm going to take a really quick sip of coffee. And now we move into the next week. Uh, beginning with January 9th. And on this day, we have Venus forming a trine with Mars, who is also in retrograde. Mars has been in retrograde since, as you can see, he's going uh, direct right here. So we'll talk about that really quickly. Venus trine Mars is going to maybe help us really understand a balance, especially with Mars standing still. He's really contemplative in Gemini about, you know, a lot of, again, with the big brain stuff, really curious about things. And in air, the triplicity of Gemini, Mars has been quite chaotic and has been out of bounds by declination. So like a little bit higher than we expect uh, for much of Mars's retrograde. So the chaos energy that has been happening in Gemini for you, for your chart, wherever that is, that has been attributed to this Mars retrograde, which began on, on October 30th. Now with Venus forming a trine with Mars retrograde, we might set aside some differences to pursue curiosity and truth and find mediation in conversations of uh, opposing sides, thinking about Venus and Mars being a, a sort of binary with each other, the masculine, the feminine, the soft and the uh, aggressive, that kind of thing. Those two energies tend to be a little bit polarizing, but when they form this trine, they work together. So it's kind of a um, frenemies situation or people who were enemies 
teaming up to work together. And in fact, if you look at source material, like Firmicus Maternus, these two energies, these two planets do have a, a pretty amicable bond in general, even though they rule such different things. So if you think about Aphrodite and Aries, they still were able to come together in a lot of situations. Okay. So then on the 12th, Mars will go direct. And as I mentioned, the retrograde was October 30th. And this means that we're applying the efforts to fulfilling goals rather than draining ones. So one of the things you may have noticed since October 30th, and even in fact, since the end of August is areas of your life where your energy is being reciprocated, where you're giving your energy and you're getting energy back. And then areas of life where you're giving your energy and it's simply draining. So we want to be aware of those areas of our lives. And I think Mars has really made those obvious for us in the last few months. I know in my personal experience and in the experience of many of my clients, almost every consultation I've done since Mars retrograde has gone back to something Mars is bringing up for that client. So you're certainly not alone if you're feeling this. And yes, I do offer consultations. That's still an opportunity. Always will be. I enjoy those. I love exploring charts with everyone. So we're applying these things. and. Um, we can, we can kind of expect that these topics will still be there, still be settling. The dust will still be settling through March 15th when Mars will finally have covered those degrees one last time in Gemini. And then later in March, actually Mars will move into Cancer, an entirely new sign, along with all of the other really incredible things that are happening in March, which of course we will cover in a video much like this one. On the 13th, the sun will form a sextile with Neptune. This is a nice, subtle, great opportunity for having calm, for finding a little moment of stillness in your day and just taking yourself and tucking away for a second and just remembering to find stillness, remembering to ground yourself, remembering to feel connected. So it's, it's a lovely energy um, to be able to take advantage of if you want to. And then on the 14th, Venus will square Uranus. Now, Venus rules Uranus right now. And Uranus should have an RX there because Uranus is still retrograde at this point. So we might see some shakeups or surprises in relationships with material resources. Um, again, this is something that's going to happen on more of a collective scale possibly, but we're going to notice it because Venus makes it more personal. So you may see it in your personal life as well as in the headlines. And so that is something to keep an eye on, see what the world is going through and see how you are a part of that. And uh, so that's, that's one positive way to look at these kinds of experiences. Squares often do show up in the form of a challenge. So something is kind of bending at the point of being able to break. And so we may see some uh, surprises coming up in relationships that lead us to maybe change direction with how we approach those relationships or the way that we nurture them. So keeping that in mind around the 14th, the middle of the month, we may notice that. And that's one of the reasons, along with Mars being direct, that we call this back in action, because this is an active aspect. This is something that we'll probably notice again in the headlines, but also possibly in your personal life as well. So it's something that you already have the foreknowledge of, and you will be less surprised when it happens. And you can just say, oh, but I know this is supposed to happen. So it's going to be okay. And next, we move on to the next week, which is going to lead us into the two um, final Aquarian things of the month. So we come into the 18th through the 22nd. I call this social aesthetic. Um, you'll see why as I continue through these. And you can see that the volume of aspects is getting a little bit less throughout the rest of the month. So it's not as bundled together, uh, they say, as they observe these, but <laughs> we'll get to those in a moment. So we have the sun conjunct Pluto, beginning a whole new phase with Pluto. And at the same time, Mercury will be stationing direct. So on the 18th, we get this emerging from the evolutionary metamorphosis kind of phase of Mercury being able to move direct as the sun conjoins with Pluto, again, with that death and rebirth kind of energy, but our energy being so close and personal with it. So Pluto, transpersonal planet, really far out there. We're going to notice this possibly in the headlines, especially with Mercury being the messenger. Uh, this tends to be something that makes a headline. So Mercury moving direct while the sun conjoins Pluto, where there may be some interesting things of note all around the 18th of January. So there might be intense spiritual clarity. We're thinking about a lot of depth and intensity that comes along with this Plutonian energy. And it is 
really being carried forward by Mercury, the messenger, picking this up and translating it uh, via the moon, actually, to us. The moon is considered in astrological lore and theory, the translator of all the planets to us, which is why my planetary skits have the moon explain everything at the end. So then we come into the 20th when we begin Aquarius season. Happy solar return month to all of the Aquarian suns out there. This is going to be an interesting season of observation and appreciation. And I will show you the chart in just a moment. But what we're thinking about with uh, Aquarius season is understanding that the sun is in detriment. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that the sun doesn't have as much support and energy in Aquarius. We think, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, you're in the middle of winter. It's cold. It's not sunny. It's not as um, burning and vibrant. And if you think simply about the elements, we're in an air element, a fixed element. So those things are a little bit restrictive and not as supportive to the fiery uh materials that the sun likes to use it's a very cardinal fiery thing even though it rules leo which is fixed <laughs> so we're thinking about the sun which is the ultimate life giver when you think about the planets the one that creates the light that everything else reflects back at us just doesn't have all of the resources in aquarius but that's okay because it creates this this space or void where you get to see things from an outside perspective and Aquarius is very good at that. So through this month of, you know, the end of January into February, we often find that we get very speculative and we often find that we get maybe a little critical and just a little bit uh, inquisitive about certain things. We have this fixed air of what do I know? What do I understand? What don't I understand? And how can I make sure I understand it so that if anything comes into question, I know how to respond. So you get that Aquarian intellectual, unique, kind of sometimes rebellious energy that goes along with it as well. So to go along with that, the very next day, the moon, the translator will come in and really punctuate this energy for us with a new moon in Aquarius, manifesting a new social setting or new friends for ourselves. Aquarius is very social. It's about society as a whole. It's very much about the, the, progress of society and where can we go next and what's going to sustain that Aquarius is ruled by Saturn which may be surprising to some uh, and that is in traditional astrology Aquarius is ruled by Saturn so if you're more familiar with Uranus being the ruler of Saturn that is a more modern um, astrological att attribution but traditionally Aquarius is ruled by Saturn so what we're seeing with that is Saturn saying okay Capricorn shows me the things that have lasted Aquarius is the things that are being built in order to last, that are being built with the future in mind. So that is very Aquarian. And then on the 22nd, of course, Venus will conjoin with Saturn and Uranus will station direct. And then we will have all planets moving direct. So the way I like to see the, the vibe of Venus conjunct Saturn is sort of a dark academia. It's very aesthetic, but it's also very intellectual. It's very, you know, the straight edge and the pleats and just that kind of energy that goes along with it. And like I said, we do have all planets direct now until April 21st. So that is going to be a lot of stuff really unclogging and being able to go, if you think about a clogged sink and you finally pull the plug and all the water gets to flow freely, that might be some of the energy that we feel. And it may happen very fast and even possibly at an overwhelming pace because we get used to retrogrades pacing things for us. But this is a really great time to be moving forward with plans. Take that momentum, that energy, that wind beneath your wings and use it to your advantage and just glide with it. Think about yourself as sort of a hang glider and the wind is there for you. So social aesthetic is very much attributed to this Venus Saturn conjunction that we will be experiencing and the fact that everything gets to move forward at this point as well. So now we're going to look at the charts for Aquarius season and for this new moon in Aquarius. What we end up seeing here is we're looking at Aquarius season. So we see that the sun is at zero, zero Aquarius. That means the sun has just tipped into Aquarius and we are now experiencing that time. This is a really great time with the sun. Again, another thing about the sun being in detriment is we tend to maybe not put ourselves as first as usual. This can be a great thing. This can also be something that you want to be aware of because it can drain you. But a way to use this skillfully is to volunteer or interact with social groups, expand your friend network, go to conferences, visit new places, and really expand um, or, or think about 
the areas and the environments that nurture you and who you want to become. So we also have a lot of intellectual discussions that can go along with this. There's some great opportunity for debates to happen with the sun in Aquarius as we are all sort of identifying with what makes us different, what makes us unique, and how does that involve or how does that get brought into the rest of our world so you'll also be able to check where Aquarius is in your chart see what areas might add some flavor and volume to this for you so anything that I'm missing on this do, 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 do. so yeah we're looking at just the sun being co-present with Venus and Saturn here you can see how Venus will be conjoining Saturn in a couple days from this time we are experiencing um the the Mars trine because mars is also in an air sign so we know again that mars is uh getting ready to station direct which is fantastic and also what we can see here is that there is this square happening with uranus saturn had squared uranus for most of 2021 and into earlier this year that is finally over 10 degrees separated so we're not feeling that as intensely which is good knowing that we will be experiencing the sun square uranus as we do every year so that's not a big deal. Um, it's not as uh, potent as the sustained transit of Saturn square Uranus. And now noticing that they're far enough away that we would consider that pretty far away to, um, to say maybe not quite an aspect anymore. As you can see, they do not have that line like this one here to connect them anymore. So that's nice. All right. And then the next slide we're going to look at is the new moon. So the new moon, the affirmation I have for this is I am likable and I have tons to offer because one of the things that an Aquarius new moon might make you recognize is simply where you do stand out. And sometimes that can make you feel a little bit isolated. So if you're thinking, wow, I'm too weird, you're probably not, you're unique and you have tons to offer. And there's a place where there's a void that you fill and you'll be able to find places in that. So again, we're looking at engaging online um, or in person in discussion threads and starting to really put that knowledge that you have out there, finding the people who can appreciate it. And technology might be something that goes along with that just because Aquarius does tend to uh, attribute a lot with, or does tend to vibe a lot with technology. So we're reaching out to friends who really fit your social aesthetic. So if you are someone who has um, sort of an identity that you are working on embodying even more, finding other people who also identify with that, who are like-minded in that sense that, that make you feel a little bit more included, you might be able to find that fit um, very satisfying at that point as well. All right. So. Uh, another thing that we can think about for this new moon is that we're manifesting a new social setting and new friends. We're thinking about where we do fit and um, how we can still feel unique among all the groups of people feeling unique, but also included, which is something that is achievable, but can take a little bit of practice. All right. Um, yeah, cool. Just checking my notes, making sure that as we go into this final last few days of January, I have everything covered. And so now we slide into the end of the month with the sun forming a lovely sextile with Jupiter. You might be able to recognize that you have like a lot of energy on this day. It might feel very creative. Jupiter is in Aries. So Jupiter is kind of giving the sun a little hand up at this point um, with Jupiter not really um, having the upper hand in the aspect, unfortunately, but being able to kind of boost the sun and the sun kind of bringing back to Jupiter saying, hey, how can we hone this energy that we have, this, this vivacious ambition that Jupiter's got in Aries? How can we hone that into something like a stylus and really be precise with our creation here? So that's going to be something fun to be able to see unfold in your life. On the 26th, Venus will come into, uh, into Pisces. Venus is exalted in Pisces. So what this makes me think of is Miss Congeniality when she says, I really do want world peace because you've been through all of these things in Aquarius where you're thinking about Miss Congeniality, like what's best for everybody? How can I be of service? How can I get all of this stuff done? What does my future look like? But at the end of the day, the goal was always to find peace. So that's something to think about as Venus transits through Pisces, where she is exalted, and she will meet up with uh, Neptune through that process as well. 
And then finally on the 29th, the sun will trine Mars, which is the sort of official unofficial, like we mentioned before, Mars is well and good direct. Now we're, you know, getting into this new phase for Mars. And at the same time, Mercury and Uranus will trine, but this time, neither of them are retrograde. They have both turned. So we have this high-minded ambition that we can put external, we can make it work. So these three planets that all station direct in this month will all also interact with each other around the same day with the sun, including Mars in that as well. So thinking about this ambition that we might have for really saying, okay, now I know what I want my new year's resolution to be, because I had a lot of time to think about it, to edit it and process it over the month. But now I've got it figured out because we have these transits that allowed us to break it down, scramble up the Rubik's cube a little bit, and now put it back together so that we can say, cool, I have a very clear idea now of what I want to do, who I want to be, and how I want this year to look for me. And so for you, I hope that it is brilliant. I hope it is exciting. I hope it is fun. And I hope that in February, we meet again in this video where we can cover what's going to happen in the next month and leading into March uh, of 2023. I hope you have a wonderful new year. Thank you so much for being a part of this, for supporting this channel, for supporting the Alchemist Inkwell podcast, and for supporting me personally through at The Real Crystal Lynn on Instagram and TikTok, and scheduling consultations if you are interested in diving into your chart and geeking out about how amazing you are together. So thank you all very much, and may you have a blessed and beautiful new year.